Today I'm going to talk about dyslexia. I'm going to talk about what it is, how it is diagnosed, and what can be done about it. Most of this presentation is based on a webinar that was put on by Jan Hasbrook. She wrote this book, Conquering Dyslexia. She is a reading specialist and a mother of a severely dyslexic daughter. Let's start by looking at a definition of dyslexia. Dyslexia is a learning disorder that involves difficulty in reading due to problems identifying speech sounds and learning how to relate to letters and words, which is decoding. It also affects areas of the brain that process language. Now I want to look at some misconceptions as far as what dyslexia is. is. Some people think it's reversals, it's reading backwards, it's the text moving on the page, it's eye or vision issues, that boys have it more than girls, and that the student just needs to try harder. Now let's look at what it is. Dyslexia is also not a visual spatial issue, it's an auditory issue. It's an auditory processing issue. And one of the ways we know this is because it's relatively easy for blind people to learn how to read using Braille, whereas it's very hard for deaf people to learn how to read. We also have advancements in medical te technology as far as the use of scans, and therefore we're able to see what's going on in the brain with people with dyslexia. Dyslexia varies in intensity and impact. It can be mild to severe. It is genetic. If you have a parent that is has dyslexia, you have a 30 to 50% chance of being born with dyslexia. There is no cure. It is uh, a cluster of genes, not just one gene. And it can affect speaking fluency. It can have emotional consequences, such as low self-esteem or self-confidence. And it affects perhaps anywhere from 10 to 15% of the population. They believe that about 700 million people worldwide have dyslexia. I mentioned the use of uh, scans to see what's going on in the brain. And if you look at this scan, um, this is two different brains of two different five-year-olds. They are both engaged in some type of literacy activities, such as saying the ABCs. If you look at the one on the left, that child is not at risk. Um, the area that is right um, here, this is the left side of the brain, and you can see it's pretty lit up. That's where the auditory processing happens. Whereas you look at the other, the other scan, that there's not much going on in that part of the brain. And that person, that child would be at risk. So reading is not learned in the same way we learn to talk. Learning to read requires building a new circuit linking the visual code to existing neural systems for language. So basically what that's saying is that language is natural, but reading is not. This is called the ladder of reading. It shows the amount of effort it takes for people to learn how to read. So if you look at the top, the 5%, 5% learning to read seems effortless. It's just natural and they just know how to do it. And it's often at an early age. And then there's 35%. Learning to read is relatively easy with broad instruction. And then we have the 40 to 50%. Learning to read proficiently requires code-based, explicit, explicit, systematic, and sequential instruction. And that's just good instruction at the foundational level. If you look at the bottom, the 10 to 15%, those are people with dyslexia. And that learning to read requires code-based, explicit, systematic, sequential, diagnostic instruction with many repetitions. So those people are going to probably need extra help with reading, and they're going to have to work a little bit harder. Now, I, I want to look a little bit at the area that uh, 40 to 50 percent. Sometimes people that are in this area might appear that they're down here, and that can be caused by a lot of things, such as um, inconsistency with their education, uh, poor instruction at the foundational level, uh, trauma, and perhaps missing a lot of school. Another thing I want to mention that can affect kids, if you have a child that is struggling with reading and you're putting them in a different school every year, that can really be, uh, be a disadvantage to them because it takes a while for the school to identify if they're having an issue and then to get the help in place. So every time you move them, it starts over and it puts them back. So you have to do what's right for your child, but if they're struggling, that can put them at a disadvantage. Let's look at the simple view of reading. So reading comprehension, was, which is the purpose of reading, is a combination of language comprehension, which is the ability to understand spoken language, and decoding, which is word recognition and being able to sound out words using phonics skills. 
Uh, this is just something I want you to look. It's more of a visual thing for you. It shows all the connections that are that need to happen in the brain, all the links and connections for decoding, and also all the links and connections that need to happen for language comprehension. And then again, if you have both, you can have reading comprehension. This is another way of looking at it. So again, um, reading comprehension is a combination of language comprehension, which is background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge, and also word recognition, which is phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition. And when you have all those, you can, you can be a skilled reader. Now, in this area, the word recognition, that's where people with dyslexia have most of the issues in that area. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, those three aspects of reading, the phonological awareness, the decoding, and the sight recognition. So it's important to know that there is not one measure that exists to diagnose dyslexia. So we have a parent that comes to us and asks us if we can test their child for dyslexia. There isn't a test that we can give him or her and say, yes, they are, or no, they're not. So one of the things uh, when, when kids are young, when they're in about kindergarten age, some of the signs for parents to look for are phonological awareness, and that is the ability of the brain to notice, identify, and ultimately manipulate the units of oral language, which is whole words and word parts, and that is on an auditory level. An example of that would be able to identify or produce a rhyme. Also, syllabication, which is something we speak in syllables. So it's pretty easy to clap them out. Um, we have kids in kindergarten do this and they usually can do it. An example of that would be, um, what are the syllables in the word alligator? So they would they would clap and they would say, al le -ga -tor. And most, most of the time in kindergarten, they can do that. Um, if they're struggling with this at that age, it's hard to tell in kindergarten because there's different rates of development going on, but um, it's, it's just something you just want to keep your eye on. Also phonemic awareness, that's the ability to notice, identify, and manipulate individual, individual sounds, which are phonemes in spoken words. An, ex an example of this would be to be able to segment words, such as the word pet. If we ask someone to segment pet, they would say, P -e -t. segment the word shop. What are the sounds in the word shop? Sh -a -p. And although the sound SH is two letters, it's one sound. SH works together to say the sound sh. So that would be an individual phoneme. Uh, they may also have difficulty pronouncing words, learning the alphabet, hearing and producing rhymes, noticing sound or letter patterns such as mommy and moon start with the same sound or retrieving words when speaking. So since there is not one test that we can give a student to determine whether or not they have dyslexia, we have to look at a variety of diagnostic assessments, such as phonological and phoneme awareness, I just talked about, word identification, which would be phonics and decoding skills, automatic word recognition, which are sight words, reading fluency, which are words per minute, uh, we look at spelling, handwriting, language proficiency, and listening comprehension. Here is an example of a di uh, dyslexia diagnostic checklist that we could use. Um, and of course, the more checks there are in the moderate or severe columns, the more concerned we, we would be. Some of the assessments we do here at Stellar, uh, we talked about rhyming, uh, syllabication, uh, beginning, middle, and ending sounds. We do those in kindergarten. Um, there's the phonics and decoding, which we use the BPST, which is the basic phonics skills test. That is um, all the phonics rules and being able to, to decode words. We do that four times a year for all first and second graders, eventually kindergarten, and then anybody else beyond that that we're concerned about. Um, automatic word recognition, which is sight words. We do high frequency words and irregular words. And um, we do those four times a year for all first and second grade and anybody beyond that. And then uh, kindergarten does sight words too. And then we do read and fluency and we do what's called CBMs. That would be a curriculum based measurement for fluency. We do that three times a year. And that is where the students read 
two different passages for one minute each, and it's words per minute. And there will be a benchmark. And for instance, in second grade, it could be 64 words a minute at one of the benchmark periods. And by all means, that's not speed reading. We don't want the kids to be doing speed reading. But if they're not struggling with word identification, with sight words, and they're having to stop and sound out a lot of words, they might have a hard time getting to that 64 words a minute. And then we're going to look at that and, and try to identify if they might need some help. Um, we also do the STAR test four times a year for any first grade that's ready and uh, second through eighth grade students. Uh, and that, that tests a lot of things. It's a lot of language comprehension, com comprehension, of course, um, uh, structure and key ideas. It tests all kinds of things. And we do that. And then um, there's also listening, comp comprehension, spelling, handwriting, language proficiency, of course, family history, and then we're going to make sure that they're having, they have the appropriate instruction or interventions that they need. So um, if we are concerned about a student, we're going to get intervention going as soon as possible. Intervention is critical. And um, that could be anything from working with the literacy specialists, from getting them going in a program such as Lexi or Power Up, which I'll talk a little bit more about in, in just a minute. And um, we're going to get that going. And then uh, we're never going to label a student dyslexic until the student continues to struggle despite having appropriate interventions. So if we do these interventions and we're not seeing a lot of progress, we're going to be concerned and we're probably going to have a student study team. And there's a good chance they'll get tested and they could get diagnosed. A lot of times they'll, they'll call it a learning disability. But it's important to share the diagnosis with the child and let them know that this does not mean that they're not intelligent and that um, that they can become a proficient reader. It's just going to be a little bit more hard work on their part. And it's going to they're going to it's going to require extra um, help with reading. It's also going to require ongoing family support. And of course, we're going to try to get the appropriate intervention provided as early as possible. Um, I really like this quote, effective early intervention is like building better fences at the top of the cliff rather than parking an ambulance at the bottom. So we do this, all these benchmark assessments, you know, three or four times a year. And what we do at Stellar is we sit down as a team and we look at the data and we try to identify students that might need extra help. And again, that could be working with the literacy specialist. It could get them going in a fluency program such as Read Live. Um, we could recommend that they do Lexi or Power Up. But um, I think we do a pretty good job at this. Um, we, we don't just do the test and we look at the data and we try to determine who needs, who might need extra help. Um, also at Stellar, we'd use the SIPS program. And we do that for all first graders and then any second, third, fourth, fifth graders that might need it. Um, it is a really good program. Uh, we, we give them a, a placement test and then we put them in groups according to their level. So right now we have two groups in first grade. Uh, one would be more enrichment and one would be more intervention. But SIPS is a little bit of everything. It's, um, it's a blending, being able to segment. It's uh, letter sounds, reading a list of decodable words. It's sight words. It's reading fluency. It's spelling. And it's a little comprehension. So it's a little bit of everything. It's a really good program. And we do that here at Stellar. Um, we also have Lexia, Lexia and Power Up. It's um, available for kids to do at home. Um, I'm very impressed with these programs. They're, 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 they did a great job with them. Lexia is for kindergarten through fifth grade. And the kids will take uh, auto placement tests and they'll be placed at a level anywhere from one to 21. And um, it's something that uh, uh, they can do, like I said, again, at home, they will be prescribed an amount of minutes that they should do every week. And it's usually about 40. We recommend for them to sit down for about 15 or 20 minutes at a time doing Lexia. It's also important when they're young that you sit with them, at least at first, and make sure that they're thinking before they choose their answer because if they're a little impulsive about it and they click before they think and they accidentally choose the wrong answer, it can be very frustrating because there's a built-in um, guided instruction mode with Lexia, which is pretty repetitive. But if kids need it, they need it. And that's a good thing. But if they're getting into that mode because they're they're just uh, being too quick with their answers and, and they're accidentally picking the wrong answer, even though they knew the right answer, it can be very frustrating for them. So you want to make sure that they're sitting and they're thinking before they click. And, um, and it's, it's just a great program. But if, 
you're if you have a teacher that's telling you that your child should be doing Lexia or power up that power ups for sixth through eighth grade, they should be doing it and they should be doing their minutes. The minutes are based on getting to grade level by the end of the year. Power up is for sixth through eighth grade and it's very well done too. It can really help fill in the gaps if kids get to that level and they've got some gaps with their reading skills. And um, the same thing with them, they take auto placement tests and it's a little different with them. They don't get placed at a level. There's three different strands. There is word study, grammar and comprehension and they can be placed at three different levels, foundational, intermediate and advanced. And they could be at a different level for each one of those strands. So um, it's a great program. And again, if your uh, teacher is telling you that your child should be doing it, they should be doing it. And they uh, they get prescribed an amount of minutes to power up. So usually a little bit more. I've seen anywhere from 85 minutes to 135 minutes a week. And again, that's based on trying to get them to grade level by the end of the year. So they should be doing that if uh, your teacher tells you that they, they need that. We also have a literacy specialist at Stellar. Uh, we use the Read Live program, which is um, for reading fluency. We use the Visualize and Verbalize program, and that is for reading comprehension. It helps kids learn how to, to visualize what they are reading. And then we use the LIPS program, which is the Linda Mubel Phoneme Sequencing program. And that is all um, the phonics skills and decoding skills, all the way from sounds to the multisyllabic level. So if we have a parent that comes to us and they say that they think their child is dyslexic, we are going to ask, why do you think your child is dyslexic? We're going to ask, were they diagnosed? And then we're going to ask if one of the parents might be dyslexic. And if so, were they formally diagnosed? We're going to discuss next steps. Uh, we're going to, we'll talk about interventions, but we feel that's necessary. Um, then if those aren't working, then we're possibly going to have a student study team and possibly get tested and they could possibly end up with an IEP. There are some coexisting conditions such as ADD and language development disorders. Uh, we have also noticed over the years that uh, when a child struggles, the parents are looking for a magic bullet. They want to they want to resolve it. They want to cure it. There is no cure for dyslexia. Um, there's lots of things out there that you can do. There's vision therapy, colored lenses, and dyslexia fonts. None of those are supported by science, but by all means, if if you're taking your child to one of those or using one of those, uh, it it's and it seems to be helping. That's great, but you need to know that that's not going to cure a learning disability or dyslexia. Another thing I want to mention is the three Q system, or it's also called whole, whole language. That is a reading approach that was very common back in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. That um, they that they what they were saying is that you really don't need to learn all the the phonics skills. You don't need to do the spelling patterns. That you can just figure out what words are by using pictures and first sounds for context clues. Well, now they're realizing that that approach is not good and it's actually detrimental because it causes guessing, which is a really hard habit to break. And um, it's you don't go through the mental exercise of sounding out a word and then therefore that goes into the word bank in your brain. And um, so they're realizing that it's really not a good approach. And um, we, I think that we have a lot of parents now are at the age that might have had this approach when they were learning to read at the foundational levels. And sometimes I think they think that they're dyslexic. They might be, but I think sometimes they think they are because they have gaps in spelling or different reading skills. And um, it could be just because, like I said earlier, um, one of the things that can make you appear in the dyslexic areas is that you don't have good foundational instruction. And, and that could be why. Um, there are also private reading centers. I'm sure a lot of them are very good. Um, if you can take your child there, I um, one of my concerns about them is I think that most of them are pretty expensive and you can usually only afford to go once a week. Um, I think you're just as well off or maybe even better off trying to get help through the schools. The schools have a lot of resources and um, they can help your child more than once a week and we can give them the resources that they need to get the interventions and the help they need. And I've been working with kids for many, many years and I've worked with a lot of kids that struggle when they're young. And I, what I have seen is the kids that get the consistent help. Sometimes they get, they're on IEP, sometimes they're not, but they get consistent help. And a lot of them become proficient readers when they're a little bit older. And, um, and some of the kids I worked with, they ended up loving to read. 
So um, the schools can, they have a lot of resources. And if you're concerned, you should first talk to your teacher. So I will leave you with this. Um, if you have a child that is diagnosed with dyslexia, this is something you can share with them. These are all people that apparently have dyslexia and they are obviously all very successful in life. So although there is no cure for dyslexia, you can overcome it and you can become very successful. Thank you.